Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Well, not so not so much morning. Everyone's all over the place. I see we've got a few people from California on here today. Welcome to the, the latest Go One webinar here today, where we have Kevin Eikenberry, who has written a book called From Bud to Boss, Making the Successful Transition to Leadership on the line, and he's going to be helping us walk through some of the concepts in here and talking about his online course. How are you going today, Kevin? I'm doing fantastic. Greetings awesome. from the USA. <laughs> it's nice to have you here. Now, today's webinar is presented by Go One and Vado. So Vado have some amazing content. Um, it's all available within the Go One system, and from four dollars per user per month, you can get all of Vado's content as a part of Go One Premium. So to, 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 to get that, just head to GoOne.com and sign up for Go One Premium. There's a free 14-day trial. You can go in and try out all of Vado's content. Vado's content also includes Kevin's courses, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I'm going to kick things over to Kevin and let him get started. One final reminder before we get started, there is the live chat happening on the right-hand side of your screen there. Feel free to drop questions in there at any time, and we'll get Kevin to answer them as we're working through. Kevin, it's all yours. I think I'm ready, except no, I'm not. <laughs> you don't want to see that slide, everybody. Um, so let me try that again, everybody. Welcome. There's the one that I think I want. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, whatever time it is for all of you. Um, I'll get these slides up and we'll get and we'll get going. Give me one sec. There they are. Uh, All right, so we've got Berkeley, Indianapolis, everywhere. Yeah, we're everywhere. We're worldwide today, and we're talking about the transition of, of folks moving from being a peer to being a boss, from moving, as we wrote in the book, from bud to boss. Specifically, though, we're going to talk about that transition today. But even if you've got folks that are um, already in that front level leadership role in our experience, oftentimes uh, six months, eight months, one year, or even longer. A lot of these things that we're going to talk about today, they haven't really done very successfully or had much much opportunity to think about. So I think that you'll find that what we're going to talk about is going to be valuable beyond just that moment or those days or those weeks of the transition itself. And I'm really excited to be with here, you all here today to share with you. So here's what we're going to talk about today. I've got five uh, big ideas. Um, number one, we're going to talk about the common mistakes that new leaders make. We're going to talk about the big four perspectives that must change for us to move from being an individual contributor to being a leader, a supervisor, a manager, a boss, whatever word you want to use there. Um, we're going to talk about how to manage relationships and expectations, which is a huge piece of that transition. And uh, we have found, Scott, one of the things that people don't seem to like doing are performance reviews. And, you know, shocking, isn't it? And and the yeah. reality is that, uh, quite honestly, when we've never done them, they're even harder. So we're going to spend some time on that very tactical thing before we're done today. And you see the last bullet here says your questions. But fundamentally, we're going to take your questions throughout. Uh, I can, the way my screen is set up, I can't see the whole chat, but Scott's going to wave his arm or he's going to yell at me or whatever if we've got some stuff. So if you've got questions, there'll be several times I'm going to ask you to engage. But when I don't, if you've got a question anywhere along the way, a comment, just uh, throw it up there. Uh, you'll all be able to see it. And I really won't exactly, but that's okay. Cause we'll it's got to be on track. Yeah, we'll, we'll be all good. So with that, everybody, we're going to dive in. And speaking of getting you involved, here's the first question. What is the most important thing, idea, or concept that you want to get from our time together today? So I'd like you to take just a second to think about that. What is the most important idea, concept, or thing that you want to get from our time together? And if you have an idea and you want to put it in the chat, that would be Fantastic. We'll give you just a second to think about that before we move on. See, it's one thing, everybody, to say where you're from. It's another thing to actually answer the question on the slide. Um, so I'm going to move on and let you keep thinking about that. And if you have things, just please put them up there, because here's the thing. If you don't tell me, then I can't meet those specific expectations that you have. Let me, let me say this as well, that the reason I asked this question isn't just for the fact that it would help me or to engage you, right? It's also because this is the kind of reflective question 
that's critical for us as leaders to think about that maybe we didn't think about before. Well, anytime that you come to any kind of learning experience, if you can stop and ask that question on the front end, you're going to be more successful on the back end. So uh, I am going to move on because clearly you don't want to tell me. Uh, so we're going to go on. But I, 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 again, I want your ideas here. And maybe this is a safer thing to ask. There you go. Supporting new managers. Thank you, Kimberly. Here's the question I want to ask you now. When, when you've observed new leaders or when you were a new leader or if you are a new leader, what are the biggest mistakes that you've seen people make when they get promoted or when they're leading a brand new team? That's my question. What are the common mistakes that you see new leaders making? And if you would put those in the chat, because I want to talk about those challenges, those mistakes that you've seen. What are the common mistakes that new leaders make when they first get started, uh, that get in their way, that cause them all sorts of problems? Anybody have any? I'll give you a minute to think about that. If you don't, I'm going to make Scott come up with some. So there's so many. Well, yeah, there are a lot of them. That's for sure. Uh, not being able to hold people accountable. That's awesome. Thank you, Zoe. That's that's clearly one. And we'll, so I just want to get three or four of them out, and then we'll talk. I'll I'll spend a few minutes talking about about the ones that come up. Okay. <laughs> so Kimber says, "Give me a minute." Okay. Uh, not being able to give constructive feedback. Okay. Excellent. And and. While the rest of you are typing, I'll say, uh, Kimberly, it might be not being able to or not knowing how to, right? It could be a knowledge as well as a skill thing, uh, for sure. Yes, both. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I'm going to put a couple in there as well. Here's one. Um, <clears throat> Well, let's see, lacking active listening skills. How about this? Changing too much too quick. Trying to be everybody's friend. Anybody ever experienced either of those two? Anybody? Yes, okay. Not knowing the current legislation, well, there's an excellent point, right? Like, what's, uh, what are, what do we need to know in terms of the laws, in terms of the policies, and sort of some of those things, Michael? That's a really good point as well. We're not really going to get into that, but that because that's going to de depend a lot on your organization, on the, uh, the, the state, and the, and the, the, all of the government regulations wherever you are. Uh, but it's clearly a true statement michael without question and and you know that's one we'll start right there with michael's point that's one that you know that's kind of on the organization and hr to provide people with that what we find a lot of times is people will do training uh michael on the stuff that keeps people out of jail but they really won't do training on all the other kind of stuff that we're talking about today and that uh, as scott has said that there's uh, a lot of tools available uh, through go one so um so let's talk about some of these others let's talk about not being able to hold people accountable. So, so why is that? Oftentimes they don't want to hold people accountable. They don't know how, they don't know how, or they don't want to because they want to be people's pals, right? They don't want to be, they don't want to rock the boat too much. They, uh, they, that's the kind of thing we sometimes get, right? But you know, the, we have the opposite of that as well. We have the opposite of that, which looks like this. Like I'm not, now, I'm going to I'm going to hold everybody accountable. I'm going to be the rule with the iron fist. It's my way or the highway. I'm going to take everything right to the letter of the law. And haven't you also seen that side of that as well? And you've seen the people that want to change things too quick. I'm going to ask you about that one, everybody. Why is it that leaders often, when they move into a new role, want to make a bunch of changes right away? Just type, type in the reasons you think or I've seen before. What are the reasons from your perspective? Anybody? Why do people start to make a bunch of change too quick? Give you a second to think about that. Yep. They, their ability, they want to, they want to assert authority. I think is what that, yep. I thought so. Right. They think they know better. They think they're supposed to, they want to establish credibility. Okay. See, here's the thing. I can ask all kinds of people, about a mistake, yeah, they want to be seen as doing things differently. I love this list. Um, here's the thing. 
They want to be credible. They want to assert their authority. Sometimes they think that's what they're supposed to do. They want to be known for something. It's a great point, Jeremy. I want to make my mark. I want to be known. Here's the thing. I want to go to, to, to Brett's point. They want to be seen as doing things differently. They may have been asked when they got hired and said, listen, I need you to make some changes because things aren't so great around here. And so they go in right away to try to do that, to prove that they were the right person to hire, to prove that they can do the job, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the thing. I love your list, everybody, because there's a lots of reasons why it might happen. And some of those are even understandable reasons, aren't they? But the problem is that we would all see it as a mistake because it's too much. So let me, uh, let me show you this by, I believe that the key to solving all these problems is, is about balance. It's about finding a balance between a couple of different sides. Let me give you some examples that will actually talk to several of the issues that you guys described. Number one is, is what I'm going to call the change balance. That's the last one on this list. It's directly related to our thing. See, here's the thing. We make a mistake if we change too much too fast, and we make a mistake if we don't change anything. The right answer is somewhere in the middle. The problem with the changing things too fast is that you don't really get people engaged with you, do you? See, here's what I would suggest a new leader should do when they come in. When they come in, they should um, take the time to do what I call a listening tour. I'm going to go around and talk to everybody on the team and find out what their concerns are, what their issues are, what they would do if they were in my role, all of those things. And guess what? Some of those changes that I've got in mind as the new leader will be the same things I will hear from the team. And if I hear them from the team, they are no longer things that I'm going to do, but there are things that the team or at least some members of the team are going to want, want to do. And it totally changes the dynamic of that change, doesn't it? Now it's whose change? The team's change. So my advice always is go on a listening tour, find out from everybody what the issues are from their perspective. And, and that doesn't mean you have to take action on all of the things you hear. What it means is I'm going to take into account the things that I hear. I'm going to recognize that some of what I hear will be brand new information. Some will confirm what I already was thinking, and it's going to give you a very different sort of outcome for the process. So the other differences here, you know, we had the comment earlier about uh, not wanting to hold people accountable. Uh, a related one to that is people that uh, people that either don't want to delegate anything, we'll talk more about that later, or they want to delegate everything, right? And the right answer to that is not either end, but somewhere in the middle. And Michael had the comment about making sure people know the rules. Um, but here's the here's the thing on the rules, right? We either don't want to, we're either too lax or we're too uh, mili militant in the enforcement of the rules. And neither one of those is the right answer. The right answer is somewhere in the middle. Where in the middle depends a lot on the specifics of the situation, the maturity, excuse me, of the group, but a much more subtle sort of thing to consider. And the other one that I would say is the relationship balance. The other one that I tossed onto our list is uh, the mistake that sometimes leaders make is that they want to be make friends or be friends. Uh, and the other end of that spectrum is I've got to, I, I can't, I can't make friends or fraternize with my team because I'm now the boss. And guess what? Neither end of that spectrum is exactly the right thing. Let me just say this. That, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but fundamentally, uh, my let me just do this. I'm going to have you answer this question in the chat as well. How many of you believe, and you can just put, uh, raise your hand or say yep or whatever, uh, if you believe it's possible or it's okay to be friends with people that you lead? How many think, just quickly, yep, it's, it's possible, it's okay uh, to be a friend with someone that you lead? Benny says yes. I got another yes. I got yeses. I got it's okay. I got yeses. Yes, it's possible. Yes. Yo, look at us all. We're all in the same place. We're all in, we're all in agreement. Thank you, Kimberly, for the hand. Uh, so here's – now, just because it's possible, just because it can be true, should the goal be to make friends? Yes or no? As a leader, should it be our – no. Zoe says. Jeremy says no. See, there's a big difference between – 
being friendly and trying to make a friend. There's a big difference between being like a bull and trying to be liked. The right place on the relationship balance is this. I, I know that if I want people to follow me, if I am their leader and I want them to follow me, I know that they are much more likely to follow me if they know, like, and trust me. So I'm right in line with all of you guys in the way you answered those two questions. The reality is as a result of everything that you do as a leader, you might end up having some folks that you truly call a friend. I can certainly say that. And yet it'll never be the same as if you were just peers. And that doesn't mean we should be scared of that or worried about that. And we'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. But on that note about the whole relationship piece, does anybody anybody have a question or a comment about that specifically before I go on? If you do, type it in and we'll uh, we'll talk about it before we go on. Because I know that often that's the kind of thing that people want to, to think more about. Anybody have something you want to add there? No, I don't see anything. So we're going to go on. So let me tell you. Let me tell you this, everybody. One of the things that I promise you is that I'm going to, we're going to talk about the things that change when we get promoted. And I believe that there are four big areas where things change. And you can see that I've put it on the this, on this slide here for you. The first thing that changes is relationships. And we've just hinted at that. Like I was a member of the team and now some of those people are now, I'm, I am now leading, right? Last week we had a beer. Next week I'm doing your performance review. And so that's a change. Relationships change expectations of our work and what we're supposed to be doing change the skills that we need to be successful change and our perspective needs to change. Although sometimes it doesn't, I believe that these are the four areas of change that we have to be able to, to navigate if we're going to be successful in moving from being an individual contributor to being a manager or supervisor or leader. And I know that at least a couple of you are here to think about that. How do I support those new leaders? Well, part of it relates to how you help them navigate these four sets of changes. And that's going to be what we're going to talk about next. So let me continue on that path. And let's talk, we'll talk about each of these four. So I'm going to scroll the slides this way. And um, here we go. First is relationship changes. Let's think about this. Well, here's the first thing I would say. At, when you move from being an individual contributor to being the leader of a team, you formerly were on one team, right? The team that you were a member of. Now, as a leader, you're on at least two teams. You're on the team of your new peers, and you're on the team that you lead. And I believe that as a leader, as a supervisor, as a manager, as a boss, we are a part of the team that we lead. And so I believe that you're on at least two teams once you make that transition. And so if you uh, are now on a team of people that used to be, you know, at the supervisor level and you weren't there, you're now on a new team. And so the relationships that you need to have with those people are going to be different. And so there's relationship changes with the new team that you're on. There's, re there's relationship changes with the people that you used to be peers with that you now are leading. That's the one people think of most often. There are relationship changes with other leaders in the organization. Perhaps there's a relationship change with your former boss who may now you may now be on the same level as, or now you're in another part of the organization and your relationship with them isn't the same. I've found people have a challenge with that sometimes. And then, you know, you now have a, you probably have a new boss and that new boss requires you to build relationships with that person as well. So there's a tremendous amount of relationship change that's going on here. And it's just important that we keep all of that really, truly keep all of that in mind. Okay. We're going to talk about how we deal with that next, because what I want to talk about is I believe that the way to deal with these is to make sure that you're having what we call the transition conversations. Okay. So let's talk about it this way. Uh, you get promoted. You were on the team and now you're leading the team. You really ought to have a conversation with the entire team, don't you think? Uh, because guess what's happened? Everything's changed for everybody. You have a new job. Their job has changed because they have a new boss. 
they have a new set of expectations around them because you, you you're going to be a different leader than the person before you, et cetera. Let's say that you're following a legend, like someone who was phenomenal, and now you're the new person. What should the conversation be? Well, the conversation should be, should have this conversation say, listen, I'm new. I'm not that guy or gal. I'm not going to be as, I'm not going to be as good as them tomorrow. I ask you for grace and patience, right? I'm going to do things a little different. We'll figure it out. Here's what I'm expecting. Here's, you start to have a conversation about I'm not them, right? Here's how I want us to work together. Let's talk about how we can work best together. And if you're following the person that everyone was ready to have gone, well, then again, you know, the world is going to be different. I'm going to try to be a more effective leader. I'm going to try to be a different leader. But you want to have that conversation with those folks, right, about what it looks like for you to lead and what you expect of them, not from a place of here I'm the sheriff and here's there's a new sheriff in town, but from the place of let's open up a conversation about how we're going to work together. It's the second one that people often really want to talk about, right? Scott and I, buddies, and I got promoted and now he works for me. So if I don't have a conversation with Scott, there's going to be a problem someday, right? Um, because our relationship has to change at least a little bit, right? Because they're, they're, in the past, Scott and I would go have a beverage and we'd talk about anything at work, right? And now there's some things that Scott could have told me before when we were peers that if he tells me now, I really can't take off my company hat and ignore or not do anything with that. So there may be things now that Scott really better not share with me or put me in an uncomfortable position thinking that I won't share because I really have a responsibility to share. Now, see, if Scott and I have that conversation and we talk about those boundaries, chances are it'll all be fine. He may not love it. It may be hard for us to navigate. But if we have that conversation on the front end, we're in a much better place, aren't we? What about the fact Scott and I went to lunch every day and now uh, I get promoted and I'm busy. I got all this new stuff to do. I'm trying to figure out this new job and I just can't go to lunch with Scott every day. And if I don't ever have a conversation with him after a week or two and I've not gone to lunch with him once yet, what's he going to start to say? What are you starting to say, Scott? What are you thinking? If we always went to lunch and now I'm not going to lunch with you anymore, what are you probably, what's the cynical thing that you're thinking about me? Oh, you abandoned me. You just left me. Uh, yeah, you know, he gets a new job and he's like too good for us now. He's abandoning us. Like he doesn't care anymore. What happened to him? Right? Y'all, he gets a new job, gets a big head. We could make a whole long list, right? <laughs> abandoning at a minimum. And so here's the thing. If I have a conversation with Scott and say, hey, man, I just can't go to lunch with you every day, because not because I don't want to, but because I got too many things to do. And I don't want to put you in an uncomfortable position of being seen as the boss's pet, right? And I don't want to be seen as someone who's playing favorites. See, Scott may not love that conversation, but if we have it, he'll probably understand it. If we don't have it, his brain goes wild. And he was being very kind to me there. But at a minimum, the stuff that Scott said would be true in his head might not be my intention at all. How about the person that also wanted the job and you got it? And now you were they you were peers and now you're in charge and they wanted the job. Or maybe they trained you and you got the job. You need to do you think you might have to have a conversation with them to try to clear the air and set things straight and help them move forward? I would say so. Absolutely. What about your new peers? Maybe you looked up to them before and, and you, that you saw them as a mentor perhaps, and now you're peers. And so you might want to have a conversation. See, here are all of these conversations. These conversations are about several clear things. And we could go through this list. I'm happy to talk about any other sort of group that you want me to talk about. But here's the key. The key is, if I can get my screen to move again here. There we go. The key is number one, make these conversations intentional. You need to have them. And if you're on this webinar and you were promoted three, four, five, six months ago, and you say, well, I never had those, those conversations. I would encourage you to still have them because maybe things have kind of gone okay and you haven't had any major ripples, but especially with those friends 
Uh, someday there's going to be a problem. And if you haven't talked about it up front, it's going to be way worse than it would have been if you just talked about it on the front end. And don't just take it for granted that because they say, hey, we're good, we're good, that you don't need to have it. Listen, you ought to have the conversation. It doesn't have to necessarily be long, but you need to have a clear, intentional conversation with all those kinds of groups so that we can do what? Set clear expectations both ways. What can we talk about? What can't we talk about? What will we do? What won't we do? What's it going to look like? Establish establish some relationship boundaries. Let me give you another example. It's interesting. Um, I asked you guys earlier, is it okay? Can you be friends with people? And you all, and you all said yes. But here's the thing. Um, yeah, he's a high roller now. I, I saw that note. Thank you. Uh, here's the thing. Um, and now I lost my train of thought. I lost where I was going. I see the high roller comment, and now I lost where I was headed. Um let me put it this way. Um, I really, truly did lose my thoughts. So I'm going to move on. Um, we need to set expectations both ways. We need to establish relationship boundaries. I remember what it was. So sometimes when I ask people, can we be friends? It's an unfair question because to some of us on this call, we talk, think about the word friend and we think I, I got three close friends. And I guess some people say I got 303 Facebook friends and both people are right about how you define the word friend, right? But let's use Facebook as another example of the setting relationship boundaries piece. Scott and I are buddies, been buddies a long time. I'm now the boss and we're friends on Facebook, have been friends on Facebook for a long time, right? And, um, and I see from the Facebook comments and from the photos that Scott had a really good weekend. Like he was up late, had a really good time. And then he calls in sick on Monday morning. What am I supposed to do with that? Like I know. I'm pretty sure I know why he called in sick and it's not because he's got the flu. It's because of the wild weekend. Now I'm in a difficult situation, right? And if I take my role as a leader uh, clearly and consciously, I've got to maybe do something or at least ask a hard question of Scott. So we should have those kinds of conversations on the front end. Listen, buddy, if that happens, you got to know, that I, I can't turn a blind eye. It's not because I don't care. It's just because I've got a set of responsibilities that I have to live up to, right? So some people decide whatever they decide to do with Facebook. Some say I'm not going to be friends with any of them. Some say it's fine. Uh, you know, I'm friends with, I think, everyone on my team on Facebook. And uh, I'm not on Facebook a lot. And I'm not certainly searching on what they're doing. But the fact is we've had that kind of conversation so that we can have clear boundaries around that. I actually find it to be quite valuable. It gives me things that I now know that they did on their weekend or whatever. If I do notice, it gives me something to do to, to work to build the relationship with them. Uh, but we need to establish those boundaries. And the last thing is, you know, we all don't communicate in exactly the same way, right? We have different communication styles and preferences. And so especially if I'm moving into a role as a leader and I don't know, let's say I didn't know Scott and now I, he works for me. I need to understand how he communicates and how we're going to work best together, not only in terms of style, but in terms of how often are we going to have one-on-ones? Um, um, what is my preference about email versus instant message versus face-to-face? -face? And on and on and on. And if we have those kinds of conversations, if we set some ground rules, we have some clearer expectations, uh, these transitions will go much better. And again, if you haven't had them and you've been in the role a while, especially if you're having challenges with anybody in those groups, I'd encourage you to still go back and have those conversations because they'll make a big difference. So questions or comments, anyone, before we move on? We're going to move past the relationship piece mostly now. And I just want to make sure I've got any everyone's comments or questions handled before I move on. Anybody have anything? Give you a minute to, to think about it. Well, thank you, Zoe. I have found that this, that what we've just talked about is it's, it's not rock. Nothing I just talked about is rocket science. But what I found is that when we make it, I mean, underline this word intentional in your notes, right? When we make it intentional and when we stop and think about it, it will make all of the difference. Does anybody have anybody in these other groups that you want me to make a comment about or, um, Share an example of anybody. Okay.
Okay. Well, then I'm going to move on. If you if you put one in there, I'll go, I'll I'll loop back. I promise. So we said one of the one of the changes is relationship changes. We just talked about that. Another one of the big changes when we get promoted is the changes in skills. Now we call these the first five. And in in uh, my book, in our book, remark uh, excuse me, in our book from Bud to Boss, and in the e-learning modules that we're going to talk about before we're done, we talk about six areas. One is the transition. We just talked about that. And the other are the five major skill areas that we think change significantly and become more important than they were for us before when we were an individual contributor. And those are change. We have to think about change very differently as a leader than as a member of the team. We have a different set of responsibilities about it. We're, we're way more involved in it. We're thinking about it on the front end and change is a huge change that we have. The skill of leading and championing change is a huge thing that we've got to learn how to do. Second is our communication skills must improve and change. We have to communicate with more people more frequently and a broader range of, of subjects than we ever did as an individual contributor. And our ability to communicate is a huge part of our success as a leader. So the importance of communication changes and the complexity of communication changes once we are promoted. The third C is the C of coaching. Uh, I was sharing with Scott that did another webinar earlier today, and, and we were talking about coaching on that webinar. And we were talking about the fact that coaching is a foundational skill for us as leaders. And most people, when they get promoted, don't aren't promoted because they are able to coach. Now, some of us have some experience in that perhaps, and we bring that with us, but for the most part, we're not, we're not asked or expected to be a, much of a coach, certainly not in the, in the supervisory way before we are promoted. This is a really important skill. Our job as a leader includes developing our folks, and we've got to be able to develop our folks. We've got to be able to coach and mentor and provide feedback if we want to be a successful leader. The fourth skill change is all around collaboration and teamwork. How do we build a team? How do we keep a team cohesive? How do we set team goals? How do we help an org how do we help the, the team uh, get work done together? All of those things. That's another set of skills we probably didn't have to think about or be responsible for before we got promoted. And the fifth is Commitment to success. That's what we call it in the book. It's the commitment to success. We wanted, Scott, we need another C, just to, to be clear. Uh, but it's really, it's really the piece on goals, right? As a leader, we have to be thinking about where we're headed as a group. What are the goals? What are the accomplishments that we need to reach? What are the projects we need to work on? And how do we help? Not, not just how do we set goals, but how do we help people achieve those goals. Oftentimes people will think about the setting part, but not spend enough time on the getting part. And r really all five of these are the, are critical skills. There's a longer list of skills we could say that it takes to be a highly effective leader. And, and we could argue that some of those could be on this list. What we did is we said, hey, where do we need to start? Where are the big areas that we need to get better at early and that maybe we didn't come into the role equipped for? Because uh, answer this for me, everybody. You can put, give me a yep or whatever if, this, if you've experienced this. That oftentimes the people that get promoted were the people who were best at the other job. They weren't necess wasn't necessarily because they'd exhibited any of these skills. It's because they were really good salespeople, so they become a sales manager. They were really good accountants, so they become the accounting supervisor. They were really good maintenance people, so they become the maintenance supervisor. Just give me a yep or a hand or something if you've experienced that or seen that. It's very common. And we'll talk about where that gets into a problem a little later. It's a common for at least one person who gave us a yep on that one. Um, but we see it over and over happening. And so it's great if that's how we got promoted. That's fine. But we've got to equip our folks then to be successful once they've made the change. And if we don't really do much except give them the stuff to keep them out of jail, right? Teach them the policies, teach them the laws, tell them what questions not to ask in an interview. Like we need to do those things. It's just not enough. It's just not enough if we want to really be successful, okay? So um, my co-author on this book, Guy Harris, was a nuclear submarine 
uh, chief officer in the in the United States Navy. So he loves this metaphor of a boat or a ship, excuse me, in the water. And it's a great metaphor. And here's the point that I want to make with it. When you look at that vessel in that water, you can see that it's leaving a wake, right? And the speed at which the ship is traveling and the direction at which the, the ship is traveling is all going to influence and impact the water around it. Similarly for us as a leader, how we show up as a leader is impacting everyone else around us, right? Everything around us is different because of the impact that we leave because of the way that we lead or not. And so I, I want to play with that just a little bit in this idea here that, that we believe that there's sort of two sides to the style in which we lead. And one Part of that is the re results the results that we need to get. And some leaders are very focused on getting the results. And some leaders are very focused on building the relationships or the folks involved in what we're doing. We can call this results and relationships. We can call this outcomes and others. I don't care which ones you want, what you want to call them. But the fact is that consciously or not, as leaders, we're making some decisions about this. And it's important for us to keep that in mind and think about that. And so I'm actually going to slide down two slides and come back. So I want you to think about these items right here. Uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I believe there's eleven different roles that we play as a leader. Now, First of all, many of these aren't things you've ever done before if you haven't been in a leadership role before. But these are, we would say these are 11 common things, regardless of what kind of business you're in or organization you're in, regardless of what kind of uh, role you have as a, as a leader, these are all things that you have some responsibility for, including things that you guys have already mentioned earlier, like holding people accountable. Here's the question for you. Which of these things, and I'm not going to ask you to share uh, really, but I want you to think about this for a second. I'm actually going to be quiet for a minute. And look at this list and say, which of these things do I think that that's really about results or that item is really about relationships? If you had to pick, would you put a check mark on the relationship side or on the results side? Or you say, I can't choose. I'm going to put a check mark on both. Just in order, I want you to mentally go through this list and say, which is it for me? Is it more about one or more about the other for each one of those things? Just take a second mentally and do that. And go ahead and share in the chat, anybody, if you have any observations about having done that. I don't need you to tell me which ones you did. Uh, I just am curious what your observations are of thinking about it that way. Does anybody have anything they'd want to, to say or share about that mental exercise? Give you a second to think about what you'd want to share. Anybody? Scott, this may be deeper thought than they were expecting they'd have to do on be. this webinar, which I'll is, which is fine. I'll thoughts on that then. And I'll, I'll say that I think most of them are both for that because if you're not getting results and building that relationship at the same time, you're not tapping into the full potential for each of those points. Okay. So, so Brett says positive constructive relationships should contribute to better results. And Zoe says, this isn't happening in my organization. I don't know which ones, Zoe, if it's all of them, then maybe we should have a chat. Um, but, um, you know, to your point, Scott, if I scroll back up to this slide, I believe that that's the right answer is it's both. It's results and it's not results or, but here's the thing, wherever you are, as you answer those, that's, creating the picture of how you lead, right? That's creating the wake that you're leaving. And so it's important for, uh, for uh, my 
I mean, part of my goal here was to get to the idea that basically Scott shared with it's both. If in many cases, if you force me to pick, I might pick the relationship one, I think, which is sort of where Brett is. But the point that I want to make is however you answered it is a way of seeing a bit about your focus and your leadership style. And again, my goal here is not really to tell you there's the right, the right answers near as much as it is to get you to think about what your answers are. If you've got all of your check marks on one side or the other, then maybe that says something, right? But probably you've got some balance between results and relationship. And the more balance you have, probably the more effective that you might be. And is it all situational? Of course it is. Okay. Of course it is. Okay. So I, I want to give you another piece of, uh, of perspective to consider here, uh, if I may. And that is this idea that we never had to think about this slide when we were an individual contributor, because when we were an individual contributor, we we're a part of a team and we're doing our work and we may care about it. all that's great. But the minute that we become a leader, we have to think about the fact that we are in the middle and that there are, there are messages that are coming down from above that we are responsible for sharing and representing the organization to the team that we lead. And we have a responsibility of communicating up about what our team needs, how our team's doing, how our team's feeling, where our team's stuck. We have a responsibility to communicate that up too. If we only you know, if, if we only do one of those two, we're not doing our job. The role of a leader, and I don't care if you're a front level, first line leader on your first day, or you're really even a CEO who still reports to a board of directors, you're a leader in the middle and you've got a responsibility both directions. And this is one of those perspective changes that's super important for us to keep in mind as a leader, okay? And I've got another perspective one to share with you that uh, this next slide, I think even just getting a sense from looking at the things you guys have put in the chat, I think you're going to find very useful. When I created this picture, it started, it started to make a big difference as I drew it for people. And uh, the way that it's drawn here, it's going to give you some answers right away. I, normally I would have it build, but let me just show you this, that I believe that as, a, as an individual contributor, your work would be defined by one circle. This is the work that I do. It's all inside of this circle. I believe as a leader, you have three circles. And here those three circles are. The first circle is the blue circle. That's the circle of management, right? You have budgets and forecasts and plans. You have a whole bunch of things that you need to manage. Most of the things that we must manage are things, right? Resources of some sort. And so we have a management responsibility that is a part of our job we cannot ignore. Then there's this green circle. It's a circle we'll call leadership. It's more of the things we've been talking about. It's certainly that list of five things we talked about earlier about communication and change and coaching and collaboration and teamwork and goals. Now that goals one might fit in the middle of these two circles, but fundamentally this green circle is the circle of leadership, we lead people. We manage things and we lead people. Those are those two circles. And yet you still have work, right? As front level supervisor, first level supervisor, as any kind of leader, you still have your work. Am I correct? So um, I'm going to ask people to, to put in the chat. And if we don't get them, then I'm going to ask you to answer, Scott. So you're my backup plan. Are you ready? That's all right. So I want, all right. So, um, I want you all to think about this. Which circle is this? Which circle, when someone gets promoted, which is the circle they're most comfortable in? Anybody? Just type in there over there. Which, and I'm going to ask several questions in a row. I think the answers are the same, right? Where are people most comfortable? Your work, your work, your work. Where are people most confident? Which circle are people most confident? Work. I would agree. Where have people been recognized? Like what are the what, what's the set of skills that got them promoted? Work. 
your old work, perhaps. But Jeremy, that might also be some of the new work, perhaps, right? <laughs> Especially if you're getting promoted within the same group or same part of the organization, right? Um, which is the work um, where is probably where the fires occur, where there's urgency and stuff has to get done right away. Where is that probably? Anybody? She always says leadership. It's definitely in leadership the day that the performance reviews are due. That one's certainly true. Um, <laughs> right? Here's, here's, let me, let me just share this with you. We get promoted and we were good at some stuff, especially if we got promoted within the same organization, right? We're good at some stuff. We're good at that work. And now we get promoted. And so, but we're comfortable with the yellow circle and we know the yellow circle and we've done the yellow circle and we haven't done the green and blue circles and we don't know the green and blue circles. And so as a human being, where are we going to gravitate? to the stuff that we know, the yellow circle, right? I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna generally want to move to the things we're comfortable in that we know, that we've been rewarded for, that we've, we've been recognized for, that we know. And I would submit to you that in many cases, that's where the fires are, that's where the urgencies are. Listen, if you've got, if you're a new sales manager and you've got a person and you're trying to, and there's a person having trouble making a sale, what do they wanna go do? Swoop in and make the, sale, not coach the salesperson. It's what they ought to do. It's not what they do. These three pictures, these three circles are a huge way for us to think about the perspective transition that occurs when we move from being an individual contributor to being a leader. I think these three circles also show us why leaders are so busy. I think these three circles also show us why we get in trouble and oftentimes don't delegate. Because which circle, I'm gonna ask you guys to type again, which circle is the work that we likely ought to be able to or move towards delegating? Which is the circle, is there stuff that we might be able to delegate most likely? Your work, your work. So how about this? So the stuff that we ought to be thinking about delegating, we're good at, we like, we know, and we're confident in. Why would we want to delegate that stuff? So if you are a new leader that struggles with delegation or even a more experienced leader that struggles with delegation, this is one of the reasons why. Why would I, why would I psychologically want to give up the stuff that I know, that I like, that I'm good at? Why can't I give away some of that stuff up there in the green? Well, the thing is, in your new job, that stuff you likely, in most cases, can't give away. And you're now being paid more, we can only assume, which means that you need to be doing blue and green work. And if you keep doing only yellow work, what are you really doing? You're cheating the organization by doing lower value work than you're now being paid to do. The picture of our world as a leader must include all three of these circles. We must think about all three of them. And this has a huge impact on our ability to be successful. And it's a change of perspective that I said we would talk about four changes and we talked about all four of those changes. This is a change in perspective. We have to think about the world differently if we wanna lead and lead successfully, okay? All right, we're gonna shift gears and talk about the other thing we promised in the time that we have left and that is performance reviews. How many, just give me a quick yay or yes or whatever. If you if you uh, would like to learn a little bit how to do a better job with perform, performance reviews real quickly, give me some uh, feedback over there. There's a yes, there's a yes. And we're even getting yeses, Scott, from people who haven't said much yet. Um, <laughs> Everyone's so a good review. This is what they're waiting for. Like I had a conversation with a with a client the other day, and and it was a CEO, and we we're having this conversation. He goes, well, think about it, Kevin. Um, think about your best days at work, and then at then ask the question: Is is those best days the days of your performance review? And like no, no one says that my best day was the day of my performance review. So we all have stuff in our head about this whole performance review thing. And so we're going to take just a few minutes to talk about that before we wrap up. Real quick though, um, the issues that people have with this are what? I'm just going to ask you, Scott, for out of out of time. What are the what are the big challenges that people have with? with the performance reviews, either giving or receiving them? Like what are the issues? Well, they're unsure if they're meeting the expectations that are expected of them. Okay. And uh, anxiety associated with this, this meeting? 
There's definitely, if they're unsure of what the expectations are, they're anxious about what the, the result is going to be from that review. Absolutely. And, and some people have been unhappy with them. Some people have been surprised in them. They didn't know what was coming. They got felt blindsided. We could go on and on and on. Don't like, I don't like the form. The form doesn't make any sense to me. I got this grade thing. I don't know what it even means. So let's talk about some things that we can do to make these better in the time that we have left. Shall we? Number one, performance reviews should have a behavioral focus. And what does behavior mean? Behavior means what I could see someone doing, right? It's not what their attitude is. It's not what their intention, what we assume their attention, intention to be. It's not what we think they did or why we think they did it or what they were thinking. It's what did they do? So um, if we roll the videotape and we can see it, then it's a behavior. So let's talk to people about what actually happened, what they actually did, not all these presumptions, assumptions, and dispersions that we might cast upon them. So if we can make sure that when we're doing performance reviews, it's about behavior, we've got a much better shot of people expecting it. So it means talking about actions, about words, about accomplishments, about results. That's where we need to focus. Now, Scott's feedback to me right now is, Kevin, you didn't spell behavior right. You need to add another letter in there. Uh, but and, and see, that would he could say to me, Kevin's not very, he doesn't pay close attention to detail, blah, 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 blah. But the real behavior is, Kevin, there's no you in the word, right? I need a you. And, you know, anyway, but uh, we're just a little more frugal, Scott. That's all. Um, with the letter, we, didn't, we don't need as many U's as you do for whatever reason. Uh, so here's the thing. What about feedback, whether it's positive or negative in the performance review? Um, I believe that we need to let people know what they're doing well, not just what they're not. And you can see the note says, focus on the positive and confront the negative. I don't even know if I love the word confront, but what it means, you, you can't deny it. By, by focusing on positive does not mean that we're spinning. It does excuse me, does not mean that we're, uh, that we're ignoring the negative. We don't have time to unpack this, but I believe something greater than one to one is the right ratio. Two to one, three to one, four to one. The idea being this, that if people are doing things well, they need to know that just as much as they need to know what they need to correct. And quite honestly, if we've got a year's worth of conversation or a year's worth of, worth of performance and behavior, we ought to be able to find some things they're doing well. If we can't, we're either not looking for it or they really shouldn't be here. If they're not doing anything right, why are they here? The reality is they're doing most of their job right, even if they're a, quote, poor performer. And are we, are we sharing with people what we want them to keep doing, to continue to do, as well as what we want them to adjust, change, and fix? The idea of the Pygmalion effect is this, that we tend to... People tend to live up to or down to what we believe about them and what we see in them. And so if all we see is the negative, we are not helping support them in terms of their growth and development. That's worth pondering. And again, there's a whole, Scott, have me back. We do a whole hour on that slide right there. Um, here's the thing. We also must make performance reviews ongoing. The big problem is if people don't know, as Scott said, they don't know what the expectations are. Like, so let's make those clear up front. And then if they're not meeting them, let's be talking about it on the go. The HR is telling you, you got to do this once or twice a year. Fine, do it then. But be continuing to have ongoing conversations because if we're having an ongoing conversation and we're adjusting expectations and we're talking about progress and we're adjusting where they're not quite there, when we get to the end of the year, there's no surprises because people know what they've been working on. They're making progress. We're keeping track as the leader about what's working and what's not. Like this is exactly what we need to be doing. And if we make it ongoing, we take much of the anxiety out of it. We give people a much better chance to succeed. Um, so I know that most everyone, well, let me just do this first. So we can reduce the anxiety by acknowledging it up front. So if you've never done any of these yet and, you, and you're getting ready to do one, you say, listen, I'm guessing you're not all, exci all that excited about having this meeting. I want to make this a safe place for us to think about being you being successful, right? I want, I want you to pick a time when it would work for both people. 
And I, I just want you to try to take some of the anxiety in the air out of the room so that people have a chance to be more successful. And if I were to do one thing in all of it that I would suggest that you do, um, you, you certainly need to become come prepared and be ready to go. But here's the other big thing you need to do is you need to ask them, Scott, whose performance are we talking about here? Theirs, right? Yeah. And so who needs to own the outcomes of this conversation? I do. They do. And so how often, though, does the leader do all the darn talking? There's no ownership there. Uh, if, if, if Scott is giving me a performance review, the best thing Scott can do up front is have me come prepared just like he does and then say, so, Kevin, how do you think it's gone? Let's start with your thoughts. Let's engage this in a conversation about performance. You see, I believe there are two big problems with performance reviews, and one of them is the time horizon. We spend too much time talking about the past and not enough about now what and next steps. And the other one is it ends up being a review. No one wants to be reviewed. It ends up being performance management. No one wants to be managed. It ends up being a performance evaluation. No one wants to be evaluated. But why are we doing it? We're doing it to help people get better, aren't we? So if we think about it as development, performance development, and Scott is here to help me develop, know where I'm at so I can keep getting better, then that's got a chance to really work. And so the last thing you're wondering about, I'm going to turn it over to Scott after that, is what about the form? Yes, you have a form. It's probably electronic. And here's the thing. Don't make it about the form. Have your conversations on an ongoing basis. Yes, you have some things you have to fill out in the form. Make the form about an, an outcome of the conversation rather than the reason we're doing it. Don't make the focus on the form, right? There, there are reasons that there's a form. Fine. Do the form. Don't make it about the form. Make it about developing the other person, helping them have, them have a chance to be more successful. And as a result of all that conversation, the form will be filled out and everyone else will be happy. So obviously I can't speak for your organizations, but I can say that. And I'd encourage you to think about that. Now, I know that we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I can certainly take questions before we're done, but I think the thing that I'm going to do is hand it over, I think back to you, Scott, right? Yeah. Or do you want me to talk about this right here? Um, you, you go first. You go first on that. I can do that. I can do that. We, di we didn't plan uh, yeah. for this particular slide. Let me just tell you. So we've mentioned this a couple of times. Here you can see uh, our book from Bud to Boss, from which we built this, this toolkit that is based on the Vado e-learning model, which uh, I know we call them e-learning courses or e-learning modules, but I actually believe they're more like electronic performance support. Each of them are set up. Here's my situation. What do I do? And so, yes, there's, there's a test. There's a quiz, all that stuff for all of those reasons. But fundamentally, what these are all things, I'm a new leader. I'm in this situation. What do I do when I'm in this situation? with some video, with some tools to help you get through those. So you can see they fall in these six bullet points that we've talked about today. And there's a total of 20 uh, e-learning courses or e-learning modules across all of these. And it's been our pleasure to have created these. And if you've liked what we've talked about today, you've gotten some sense of our approach in relationship to that. So now I'll hand it to you, my friend. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. That, that was a, a really good presentation. There, lots of valuable information. I'm sure everyone that, that's been on here today has got a lot out of that. Um, as you said, you've got all of those courses, which are really good courses, and everyone on here should at least be checking them out. We, do, we will be sending out a blog post to everyone that attended this with the recording of this and links to all of the, the information that Kevin's talking about here, as well as to... Go on premium where you can purchase all of those um, along with a thousand other courses for four dollars per person per month um, so that will be available kevin if people have follow-up questions you've you've dropped your email in there where i have where, can they get it you on on what's your, your website is kevin i can yeah i can um, yep let me just do socials. a couple more quick things yeah, I'll let yeah, you so, all your things there. Yeah, just a couple more quick things here. So first of all, we've created this other little free uh, tool called the seven, first seven things to do when you get promoted. And so there you can see at buddeboss.com forward slash BL, you can go get that if you want that completely free for you. You can go to buddeboss.com, get a lot of resources from us. Um, and there's all the ways to get a hold of us. If you figured out how to spell my name, you can find me. Um, 
we'd be happy to talk to you uh, in any way that we can. You see my blog. There's a blog on buddeboss.com as well. There's the community, all sorts of resources of all sorts. Um, and I just want to close uh, along with thanking Scott for the chance to be here with these four things for all of you, which is if you want to get the most from this last hour, I just really encourage you to do these four things. Number think of, number one, think about what you just got and reflect on what you hoped to get. And then go out and share something that you learned with somebody else. The fact that you teach it to someone else makes it more real for you and locks in the learning for you. If you've got questions, you've got the way to get a hold of me. Let me know if there's any way that we can support what you're doing. You want to know anything about what we talked about, be happy to help. Most of all, if you got ideas today that you that you thought were useful, go do something. Because if you don't go do anything, then we just sort of had a you know an enjoyable hour. It's only when we take action that's going to really make any difference. So Scott, I'm going to hand it back to you. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be with you all today. Yeah. One final um, thing for me is one last big thank you to Cindy and Vardo for helping to pull this together and providing Kevin to us today. We're very lucky to have Kevin on here and hope everyone got a lot out of it. Thank you very much for today, Kevin. We really appreciate you giving us an hour of your time and running through that. Um, everyone's had a, a great time on here from the looks of things, and hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Uh, and everyone else, have a good day, night, evening, wherever you are, and thanks for tuning in.